All right, let's come back together. Love these times of fellowship. It's a good time to pray for one another, uh, just to connect and find out what's going on in each other's lives. Turn in your Bibles this morning, please, to 1 Peter chapter 1. We will be finishing chapter 1 this morning, beginning in verse 13. And so let's read the passage together, beginning in verse 1 down to verse 25. The Word of God reads as follows, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, as in your ignorance. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your sojourning here in fear, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct, received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever because all flesh is as grass and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Lord, add your blessing to the reading of your word. Speak to us for your servants are listening. Help us, Lord, to be humble and open to all that you might have for us as we consider your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, I was encouraged as we considered when Pastor Mitch brought to us the message called Rejoicing in Salvation. And as I read, and I'm always thinking, you know, as I think through the passage, is there a title, Lord, that could be helpful to us? The thing that kind of stuck out to me, and I chose to call this message, the gospel informs our thinking. Not just our thinking, but also how we act. And here in verse 13, there's a shift with the word therefore. And he says, therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, you probably know this, but the world that we live in has not been redeemed. The world we live in is under the influence of the devil. In Luke chapter 4, when the devil was tempting Jesus, the devil had taken him up on a high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And here's what the devil said to Jesus. The devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whomever I wish. Now, Satan is a liar, but in that situation, he was telling the truth. That for a time, God has given these things over to him. He says, therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. That is a lie. And this is where so many people get taken astray. They believe these things about the devil and they worship the things that the devil has given them. Now, it's not always cloaked in satanic garb. Uh, there's not always a guy with, uh, you know, a red suit with a pointy tail and a pitchfork running around that we can easily identify him. 
But Jesus said to Satan in response to this offer, which Jesus knew that the offer could only come from God, it can't come from Satan. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. In 2 Corinthians 4, we find these words, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Focusing on that first phrase, uh, that the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. In 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 1 John 5.19, we find this statement by the Apostle John. We know that we are of God, and listen to this, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. In John 12, 31, Jesus says, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. Who's the ruler of this world? It's the devil. In John 14, 30, he says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming and he has nothing in me. So in case you were confused, there is no crossover between the devil and Jesus. They have nothing in common. And in John 16, he says of the Holy Spirit, when he, the Spirit, has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more, and of judgment because the ruler of this world, Satan, is judged. In Ephesians 2, Paul says of the devil, He says, uh, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, speaking of our trespasses and sins, according to the prince of the power of the air, who now works in the sons of disobedience. In Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. James 4, James wrote these words, Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You might ask, why do I share these things? Because I want us to remember this morning as we get into this, therefore gird up the loins of your mind, that we are living in a world that's distinctly under the influence of Satan, the devil, our adversary. And there is nothing good out there that you can latch on to that you can say, this is going to draw me toward God. So when we are indulging ourselves in the world or we sort of uh, allow our minds to take a bath in the world, so to speak, through media and the news and music, and all of these things, you can, you can conclude that it's going to lead somewhere that is not good. And so the reason, I think, in part, that the Holy Spirit has directed Peter to say these things, therefore gird up the loins of your mind, <clears throat> be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, is that there, the world is always against us. <clears throat> the world is always drawing us aside. The world is always <clears throat> calling us to a different place than the word of God calls us to. So as we come here, this, this therefore is the first of nine therefores in the book of First Peter. So we'll get to those as we go through it. But he starts out here by saying, gird up the loins of your mind. This is a peculiar phrase to our understanding today. So to help you be grounded in that, in those days, of course, they had long flowing robes. And if they were going to, for example, go on a journey or to go do some work, they would take that robe and sort of ball it up and pull it up around their waist. And they had a leather belt and they would take that belt and wrap it around and tie it off so that they could be free to move. So the idea behind this, gird up the loins of your mind, is don't allow your mind to 
you know, flow around the dirt. Gird up the loins of your mind. Pull, bring them into submission is what he's saying. Pull in your thoughts. Don't allow your mind to wander. Now, some of us have ADD. I get that. And we have trouble sometimes staying on point and all of that. But the idea here is not so much around ADD as it is around when we aren't thinking about the things of God, when we're caught up in the world and we're at work or whatever we're occupied with, that it can easily lead us away from God. And the Bible is pervasive in saying things to us like, all things are under the control of God. All things are under his hand. Nothing passes by his throne into our lives, but that it doesn't first pass by him. God gives us all things. God provides for us. God allows us as his servants to be in places that, uh, places of influence, places where he wants us to shine as lights in the midst of a perverse and a crooked generation. And so when he says gird up, uh, that word gird up is a verb and it means to be prepared, to have your mind prepared. In fact, we find this beautiful verse in Philippians 4.8. You may know it, and if you don't have it underlined, you should. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. This is girding your mind up. This is what it's talking about. And so... It's interesting, when he says the loins of your mind, again, when we think of loin, we're thinking of a cut of meat in the market. But their way of speaking, are, your loins is sort of this area of your body here, sort of your lower back and your kidneys. And it was regarded in Jewish thought to be the place where generative power resisted. And for the man, of course, uh, you know, that, that the seed of the man was you know, in his loins. And so, um, as they went out into a hostile world, get this, believers were to avoid panic and distraction. In times of persecution, there's always the tendency to become rattled and confused. A girded mind is one that is strong, composed, cool, and ready for action. It is unimpeded by the distraction of human fear or persecution. And so what he's calling these, these sojourners, these pilgrims too, remember as we talked about the introduction, these are people who are dispersed. They were probably originally saved or, or you know, brought up in Christ there in the region of Jerusalem from the day of Pentecost. Now we're 30 some years later. Paul's gone out and planted churches all up through the region of Turkey and Asia and, and what we know as sort of uh, Eastern Europe. But Paul, uh, Peter is writing here, as we read back at the beginning, um, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia. And that's all the areas sort of north of where Paul had established a lot of churches. And so Peter is aware that these believers are scattered. And that they are in foreign lands and that they are persecuted. And they are in places that were not originally their home. And they're just doing the best they can where they find themselves today. So his comments to them, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He's essentially saying, don't lose focus. Don't lose hope of who you are and why you are here. When you allow yourself to become distracted, when you allow your mind to go off into all these other areas and focus on all these other things, you make yourself weak. You, you, you lose your passion for the things of God. The same commentator went on to say, this state of mental solidarity is further encouraged by the words, be sober. This means self-control in contrast to hysteria. The sober spirit is poised and stable. Now, if you're the kind of person when something goes wrong, especially, you know, maybe more significant, tragic, and you have this kind of just wild emotional reaction, 
Uh, we understand, you know, we, we're, we're emotional beings, but this is saying that we should be people who are stabilized in the, the life of the Spirit and in the Word of God. I heard this little saying many years ago. It's four lines, and I've never forgotten it since the day I heard it. Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. And sow a character, reap a destiny. And that helps us understand something, that one little thought is important. In fact, our thoughts are so important that the Holy Spirit spoke to Paul in writing to the Corinthians and 2 Corinthians and said that we need to take every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. This is how powerful our thought life and our minds can be. What we think about becomes an action. If you think about anything long enough, you'll do it. If you sow an action, meaning you repeat that action over and over, now you develop a habit. How many people every year come to the turn of the year and they start reading, okay, how do I get rid of my old habits and start my new habits? And the experts say 30 to 60 days of repetition of the new thing you want to go to will help you get away from the thing you don't want to do. So actions become habits. Habits repeated over a long period of time become a part of our character and our nature. They become a part of who we are. And our character points us down the path of what eventually becomes our destiny. So we want to be careful about these things. We don't want to allow our minds to wander and to become filled with what we might call mental intoxication. Addiction to laziness. Laziness of mind lulls us into sin. Loose thinking leads to loose living. So this idea of rest your hope or set your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ is saying, keep this one thing in mind. This is not our destination. Our final destination is not a retirement home. It's not Florida or wherever you, in your mind, you want to move to Hawaii, whatever it might be. Your final destination is the throne room of God. Your final destination is heaven before Jesus Christ. So in other words, don't put down your roots here. We're just sojourners. We're just passing along. We're just going through this world. Our goal is to make it to heaven. Our goal is to be in the presence one day in Jesus, with Jesus Christ. We are to honestly be living for the future anticipating the future glory that's coming to us when Jesus is one day revealed. Does that mean that Jesus is going to be revealed at the time of the rapture of the church? Yes. Does that mean he's going to also be revealed at the end of the time of the tribulation during the time of the second coming? The answer is yes. So whether you're a believer living on this side of the rapture or whether you're on the other side of the rapture and you may be getting saved with the tribulation saints during the time of the tribulation, as we've just studied uh, in the book of Revelation. Either way, when you read this, set your hope upon the, the next coming of Jesus that's on our calendar. To be looking forward to the future glory of God. So we are to reorder the priorities of our life by how we think. Jesus said in John 16, a woman when she is in labor has sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she has given birth to the child, she no longer remembers the anguish for joy that a human being has been born into the world. Now, this is something men can't understand. Only you ladies can understand, especially if you've given birth. But as you go through the sorrows and the pain of labor and, and childbirth, once that's over and you have that child before you, there is joy inexpressible. And Jesus was speaking of this and used this analogy to help us understand that once we have passed through the labors of this life and once we have reached our final destination in the very presence of God, we will forget everything that we've been through that to us seems difficult, that seems trying, that seems hard. Paul writing to Titus 
said that we should be looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 12 says that since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This is what it means for us to gird up our minds, the loins of our minds, and to be sober and to rest our hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He goes on to say in verse 14, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts as in your ignorance. Now we're talking about our mind and we're talking about our thinking. So I want to just call a couple of things to mind here, no pun intended. Verse 13, he's contrasting the free flowing mind with the sober mind, okay? In verse 14, he's now calling us to have an obedient mind. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. So here's the idea, and in case you didn't realize this, uh, the Bible's going to help set you straight today. Before you came to know Christ, you were stupid. As in your ignorance. Stupid in what way? Maybe you could do math, okay. But not with respect to the things of God. Because we were dead in our trespasses and sins. And I have a friend many years ago, he used to say this, sort of tongue-in-cheek, but he would say, sin makes you stupid. And it does. When we follow the path of sin, you know, the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. Where does sin lead? can lead nowhere but to death. So... As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts, to the way that you lived before you came to know Christ. So he's pretty clearly saying, don't go back to what you had before. Pattern your life, is what he's saying, after the one whose name you bear. Pattern your life after the one whose name you bear. So when he says as obedient children, here's the attitude that he wants us to, to own. As a child, I want to be pleasing to my father. What pleases my father? Asking that question, what pleases his heart? What brings him joy? And while we might sit down and make a long list of things, let me just say very simply, it's obedience, it's simple obedience. In the Old Testament, uh, in the book of 1 Samuel, we find the words to obey is better than sacrifice. So our simple obedience to God is what blesses him. Just to do what is right in the sight of God. Can you imagine if we apply, apply that one litmus test to the things that we do? How it would simplify our lives? How it would change the way we act and think? Just do what is right in the sight of God. You might say, well, how do I do this? Well, again, the Bible's full of wisdom on this, but very simply, those who live according to the flesh will set their minds on the things of the flesh. Romans 8 tells us that. But if you live according to the Spirit, you'll set your mind on the things of the Spirit. If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of, a, of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. So, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lusts. That word conforming may ring a bell, Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This word is only used in two places here. And in Romans 12, too. So do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does our mind get trained? Remember we talked about sow a thought, reap an action, sow an action, reap a habit. If we want to develop holy habits, 
but we need to allow our minds to be trained by the Word of God. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Without God, without the illumination of the Holy Spirit, we walk in darkness. And he says in verse 15, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy, quoting from the book of Leviticus. We'll look at that in a moment. So we've talked about uh, the free-flowing mind versus the mind that is sober. We've talked about the obedient mind. Now we're looking at the called mind. And what are we called to be in our mind and in our heart? We're called to be holy. For you see, when we're saved, the blood of Christ cleanses us from sin. And the reason that was necessary is because God, being holy, cannot accept the unholy. He cannot accept the profane. And there is no way that we can ever make ourselves acceptable to God except by believing and receiving Jesus Christ and putting ourselves under the blood and being forgiven, having our sins forgiven. Being forgiven and receiving grace is how we become holy. So, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Your conduct is your manner of living. It's the things you do. It's how you live. It's how you think. The word holy means to be different. It means to be consecrated, to be devoted, to be sacred, to be set apart from common use unto a sacred use. So rather than imitate the ungodly world, we should allow the Holy Spirit to reproduce the holy character of Jesus in us. We are to be holy in all we do and say. We are to be holy in all of our conduct. Now, that passage that Peter's quoting from here is in Leviticus. And I'm going to read a, a few selections for you out of Leviticus 11 and Leviticus 19 and Leviticus 20. Leviticus 11. For I am the Lord your God. You shall therefore consecrate yourselves and you shall be holy for I am holy. Neither shall you defile yourselves with any creeping thing that creeps on the earth. For I am the Lord who brings you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall therefore be holy, for I am holy. Leviticus 19, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the children of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus 20, Consecrate yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am the Lord your God, and you shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. And have separated you from the peoples that you should be mine. So God is saying you belong to me. Paul picked up this idea in 1 Corinthians 6 where he says you are not your own. You are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Now some would look at this and say well here's how you achieve holiness or how you reach for holiness in your life. You become a monk or a hermit or a nun. You go and you live someone, live somewhere separated on an island or in a place where you only live with people who are saved, and you get away from the world. Now, Jesus prayed in John 17, what we call his high priestly prayer. He says, I pray for them, Lord. They're in the world, but they're not to be of the world. So the solution is not to go hibernate somewhere to become a monk or a nun or that kind of a thing, but rather to understand what he's telling us here. He, we are called to be set apart. We are to gird up the loins of our minds. We're to be set apart for God. We're to think his thoughts. We're to allow our minds to be conformed to the word of God. So he's saying, yes, you're in the world, but you're also to be in the world, but not of the world. In other words, we don't take our, our character and our significance and our nature and the things we love and that we want to imitate. We don't want to take that from the world. We take that from the Word of God. We take that from the character and the nature of God himself. As we look around the world, we see this. Anybody who's lived any length of time, you've seen 
trends come and go. You've seen fashion come and go, and now we have it even in, in spades, so to speak, with social media. I mean, things happen just like that, right? It just never stops. Commercials on TV. However the world wants to influence us, however the world wants to conform us, that's what you see happening. Those are the messages that are coming across, and they constantly pound us. Now, if you're the kind of person, and I know people like this, who have to have the TV on all day long from the time they get up to the time they go to bed, I'm just going to say this. You're putting yourself in that environment or you're putting yourself under that influence. And I would encourage you to be judicious with your use of those kinds of things because we are subjecting ourselves to those things. And just as I read these selections in Leviticus 11, 19, and 20, you heard God's voice over and over and over saying to his people, you belong to me. I redeemed you. I bought you. You're mine. You're set apart for my use. One commentator said, if something cannot be done to the glory of God, then we can be sure it must be out of the will of God. If something cannot be done to the glory of God, then we can be sure it must be out of the will of God. We are separated from evil, and we are separated unto righteousness. And he says in verse 17, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Are you seeing these words, this pattern? Keep saying the word conduct and behavior and obedience. Here he's calling us to have a reverent or a holy mind. To understand that we do belong to God. And uh, if you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work. Here's the idea. When we think of God, let's just say you, I don't know if you do this, I, I have a boss at work. I have to call him or speak to him. We have a one-on-one -on -one every other week and he always wants to kind of a rundown on what's going on and what am I working on and all those kinds of things. And if I have any issues or concerns, I, I call him up or I have other people who are, quote, mentors that I can speak to and say, hey, what about this and what about that and what you're thinking and what do you think I should do? If we call on the Father, who is the one we should be going to, right? I mean, we ought to be praying at work if you have a job. I mean, Lord, what should I, before I start asking human beings what I should do, Lord, what do you want me to do? What's the right thing to do here? And let God give us wisdom in these situations. If you call on the Father who without partiality judges according to each one's work, here's the thing. God's always going to be fair. And regardless of whether you're a, a, a gazillionaire who has done great things and has patents to your name and has had great influence on the world, or you're just the poorest, lowliest person on the face of the planet, both people approach God on the same level, on the same footing. Pastor Mitch said it last week. We approach the, the, the cross on the same level ground, all people. There is no distinction with God. There is no partiality with God. So any of us who go before God, when we pray and when we seek his face, we're all approaching him on the same level. And so he, without partiality, judges according to each one's work. And because God is going to give us, you know, the truth always, you know, the, he's not going to give me a different truth than he's going to give you. He's, we, we all have the same truth. So conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. And the word fear here is reverence and respect and honor. It's that holy fear of God. And so by having our minds sanctified and all these things we're speaking about here, this leads us to having reverence and holiness in our thinking. This verse came to mind when I was thinking about that, Mark, excuse me, Matthew 10, 28, where Jesus said, Do not fear those who kill the body, meaning people, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him, that is God, who is able to both destroy body and soul in hell. You see, we fear men. We fear mankind. But they have no influence over our eternal destiny. We stand before one judge and one king, God. And he is the one to whom we must give an account. And he says in verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things 
like silver or gold, from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. So our redemption didn't come with some kind of cheap ransom. If it can be bought with money, there's always more money to change your mind. Right? But we were redeemed not with corruptible things. And this is why Jesus said, you know, lay up treasures for yourself in heaven where moth and rust does not destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. God's economy is different. We saw toward the end of the book of Revelation, didn't we, that pavement in heaven is gold? Here it's a commodity. Here it's something we make money off of. Here it's something the world values. In heaven, not so much. Silver or gold from your aimless conduct. Before we knew Christ, we were aimless, we were godless, we were without hope in this world. He says, which you received by tradition from your fathers. Now, this is not saying you had a bad family necessarily. It's just saying that sin was passed down from generation to generation. And we go all the way back to Adam and Eve. And if any of us would have been there in the garden that day, faced with those same choices, we would have sinned in the same way. And it would have been my name there instead of Adam's name. So the tradition from your fathers is just a tradition of sin. David even wrote in Psalm 139, that beautiful psalm talking about how God formed us in our womb. He says, in sin, my mother conceived me. See, sin is the condition that's passed on genetically. That's why we need to be born again. So conduct yourself throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Remember when... Abraham and Lot, they had sort of come to this place in life where their flocks and their, their uh, slaves and all of that, their households just became too large, and they had to separate. And Abraham said, well, you choose. In whatever direction you choose, I'll go the other way. You go left, I'll go right. You go right, I'll go left. You go north, I'll go south. It's up to you, man. So what did Lot do? He chose the big city, he chose the lights, he chose, you know, to go to Sodom and Gomorrah. When he stopped being a sojourner and began being a resident of Sodom, he began to lose his witness and the power of God in his life. And so it is true for us. When we stop being a sojourner, when we stop being a pilgrim, and when we begin being a resident of this world, we lose our witness, and we lose the power of God in this life. You see, we are not to be invested in this world. We are to be invested in heaven. But with the precious blood of Christ, that's what we were redeemed with, verse 19. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot. You see, this is how we were redeemed. Not with silver, not with gold. And here's the kind of mind that this gives us. This gives us a secure mind. That what we have been redeemed with is not perishable. What we've been redeemed with cannot be questioned. And notice he says here in speaking of Jesus, as of a lamb without blemish and spot. If you look up the definitions of those two words, you'll find that they are very synonymous but if you look them up in an Old Testament dictionary with respect to how the lamb was chosen for the sacrifice, a blemish was genetic, like a birthmark or a mole or an age spot, something like that. And it's there because it was innate, it was in the genes. But a spot was something that was incurred from in interacting with the world. It was like a scar or a wound or a scratch. And so the idea is that the blemish came about because of the inward, but the spot came about because of the outward, because of our interaction with the world. And so when he says that Jesus was as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, that just confirms that he was without sin. He had no sin genetically because he was born of the Holy Spirit and had no earthly father. And he never sinned, literally, during the course of his life. 
And that's what made him the acceptable lamb of God when he went to the cross on our behalf. And that's why the book of Hebrews says this of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 9, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. For, and then Hebrews, excuse me, 2 Corinthians 5, I, I put this in here because to me it just fits. For he, God, made him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, this is the way God has bought us. This is the way he has purchased us. And so when we think about these things, when we think about the precious blood of Christ, there are five things, there's probably more, five things that the blood of Jesus does for us. One of them is we are cleansed, our consciences are cleansed from sin by the blood of Christ. We just read that in Hebrews 9. We have boldness to draw near to God, Hebrews 10 tells us, because of the blood of Christ. 1 John 1 tells us that we are progressively cleansed more and more from sin by the blood of Christ. Revelation 12 tells us that we are able to conquer the accuser of the brethren by the blood of Christ. And... This verse here, we are rescued out of a sinful, aimless, fruitless way of life by the blood of Christ. So these are things that God has done for us through Jesus. And because of this, this changes how we think. This changes how we look at things. It changes how we look at life. When we come to verse 20 here, he says... He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. So he's telling us, don't just think that this was something random that happened to you. God had a plan from before the foundation of the world that he was going to send his son, Jesus Christ, to be the propitiation for our sins, to be the one who would pay for our sins and redeem us to God. What kind of a mind does this give us? An optimistic, hopeful mind in the completed work of Christ and the future that is there for us. Because he said there in verse 21, who through him believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. Remember, hope means confident expectation of future good. It is not, I hope I win the lottery. It is, I have hope that I will see Jesus Christ. I have hope that one day I will be in the presence of God. When he says that he was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times, we find a few scriptures that speak to this. There's others. In Ephesians 3, in other ages, was not made known to the sons of men as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. So here in the New Testament, in the days following the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, the Spirit began to speak as the scriptures were being written and said, this Jesus was in fulfillment of everything that God had in mind about the Messiah. Again, Ephesians 3. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. What's all that saying? That is... People are getting saved and the church is growing. And the church is just the collection of the saints, those who believe in Christ. 
that we have a witness to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places. We are witnessing to the demons by being the church, by doing the things that God has called us to do. In Colossians 1, the mystery which has been hidden from ages uh, and from generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. And he says, your hope and your faith are in God. Why? Because God has done these things, God is doing these things, and God will do those things. We have confident hope that God will complete what he has started, that he will fulfill what his word says. And that's based on the fact of all the things he's already done of all he's already done to fulfill in history and all the prophecies that have come true in things like the birth of Jesus and as we're going to discuss in a few weeks at the time of Palm Sunday and Easter, all of the, the prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus Christ about how he came and became the Messiah for us and he became the Lamb of God. Our faith and our hope are in God. They're not in ourselves. They're not in you know, the weather, our faith and our hope are in the word of God. Verse 22, since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit, listen to what he says, in sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart. This is what he wants us to do now. This is where it leads us. It leads us to a place of confidence he gives us a confident mind now that we can live in hope. And we live being able to love one another. Jesus is the one who said, the world will know you're my disciples by your love for one another. Truth be told, this is the thing that probably turns most people off because they see our infighting and they see the way Christians can't get along. This is the point where they see the hypocrisy in the church and they don't see us loving God and loving one another the way we ought to. And so Peter has to say here to these believers, being dispersed, living in difficult times, probably living under great duress and stress, he says, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, reminding them again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. This informs how you live, how you live toward other people, how you think of other people. And when you speak of love, you, if you go to the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, there are some things in there it says about love. Love believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love expects the best and thinks the best of others. We need to have our mind changed on that, don't we? Because so often we will think about a person and not think the best, or pray for them, but think the worst. And we assess them in a light of negativity as opposed to assessing them before God in prayer, saying, God, they need you, they need help. And Lord, I'm loving them right now by praying for them and asking you to help them and to meet their need. It's a different way of thinking. And then he says, as he said, the word of God which lives and abides forever, verse 24, because, and then he quotes this beautiful thing out of Isaiah, all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the grass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. Think about all the things that Peter's saying here. About renewing our mind and the hope and uh, having our hope fully fixed upon the Lord and then just convincing them, uh, the people to whom he's writing, as well as us, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Why? And he bases it all on the bedrock foundation of the word of God. All flesh is as grass and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers, its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. God's word will never fail. God's word will never return void. God's word is not wrong and will never be wrong. God's word will never lead you or me astray. God's word is truth. 
And if you want to know what truth is, if you want to know what should I do and what should I think about this, that, or the other thing, God's word will inform your thinking if you allow him to do so. And when he said the word fervently here and how we are to love one another, the word fervently means to stretch to the limits. It means to, to meet others at their point of need. It may mean going out of your way to meet a need, to do something that's inconvenient for you, that disrupts your life, that disrupts your routine, that causes you to act with love. And you don't have to say, I love you, in the deed. Your deed speaks for itself and shows the love that God has given us. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love, brotherly love and honor giving preference to one another. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Every time I read that verse there, that came from 1 Peter 3. Here's what I think of. Someone's in your face cussing you out. God bless you. God loves you. May the Lord, may his grace shine upon you. That's the idea, right? That this thing is happening. Don't return it. Don't give back what they're giving to you. Give back better than what they're giving to you. Why? Because we're different. We're set apart. We're holy. We belong to him. The love of God's been poured out in our hearts. We've been saved. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We've been given the word of God. We've been given, he's going to tell us in 2 Peter chapter 1, everything we need pertaining to life and godliness. God is saying, I have poured out blessing upon blessing upon blessing in your life, and I want you, I expect you to give it to others. I didn't give it to you for you. I gave it to you to give to others. And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable without grumbling. As each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. And then finally in 1 John, and this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother. God has given us his word of God, his Bible, the scriptures. And this is the seed that he's given us. And we are to plant this seed and sow this seed everywhere we go. And I get the idea that we should have that bag of seed on our hip. And as we go, just everywhere we're going, we're just kind of casually sowing the seed. This is what he wants us to do. This is how he wants us to think. You see, the gospel informs our thinking. And if we think biblically, if we think gospel, if we think Bible, then we will act in such a way. Don't you agree? This is what he has for us. And I pray that I get it. I pray that you get it. I pray that we accept these things and we will allow ourselves to be changed by the word of God. Well, let's pray. And then the men are going to come and distribute the elements as we partake of the Lord's table. We're going to have a song as well just to lead us to the Lord's table. And then we will consider what God has to say to us. Lord, thank you this morning for your word. Thank you for speaking to us. Thank you for giving us these things, Lord. Your word is so rich. It's so true. And Lord, we need it so desperately. 
Lord, conform us to the image of Christ. Help us, Lord, to grow up into grace. Help us to grow up into the head, even into Christ. Lord, we love you this morning. And we can say it, we love you because you first loved us. You're the one who demonstrated love to us. So thank you for that. Thank you for all that you've given to us. And now as we turn our hearts and our minds toward your table, we pray that you would speak to us and remind us as we've just considered how deep the sacrifice, how rich, how great the payment, how great the cost to secure our salvation. And as we come today, may we come today with grateful hearts, with full hearts, with thankful hearts. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.